Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Into the Killing. In this week's episode, we're going to cover two cases. The first one happened in August 1989. On August 18, 1989, leading Colombia presidential candidate Luis Carlos Galán was assassinated, most likely by drug cartel Sicarios. On August 20th, a dredger collided with a pleasure boat on the River Thames in central London, England. Tragically, 51 people died. On August 22nd, pitching legend Nolan Ryan struck out his 5,000th batter. The next day, another baseball great, Pete Rose, was banned from baseball for life for gambling. On August 25th, thanks to the Voyager space probe, the first ring system around Neptune was discovered. Thirty-nine-year-old Susan Dahl, who lived in Fort Collins, Colorado, was selling her house. On August 29th, the real estate agent let herself into Dahl's house and found something odd in the hallway. It appeared that someone had urinated and defecated in the hallway. In the upstairs bedroom, the real estate agent found the nude, dead body of thirty-nine-year-old Susan Dahl. The real estate agent immediately called the police. Dahl had a cut phone line wrapped around her neck. It was later determined that she had been strangled to death. She had also been raped. The police looked around the house and they found more bodily fluid. On the second floor, they found semen in three separate areas. If you listen to the first episode of Into the Killing, you'll know that DNA testing was only used to identify a murderer two years earlier in 1987 in England. DNA technology was not yet a major crime-fighting tool in the United States, so the killer may not have known that his bodily fluids could be used to identify him. Or he simply didn't care. The police figured out how the killer got into the house. The killer climbed up on a fence and then on to part of the roof. Then he entered through a second floor window. On the windowsill, he left seven fingerprints. The police ran the fingerprints, but they didn't find a match. Based on some elements of the crime scene, the investigators speculated that the killer was probably a young man. The first reason they thought this is the way he entered the house. Older men don't generally climb fences to get onto roofs to break into a house. That's usually the way a kid breaks into a house. Also, the crime lacked the sophistication of an older sex criminal. An older, experienced predator probably would have cleaned up and possibly used a condom. They would not have left so much evidence behind. Nothing was stolen from the house except for her underwear. The investigators searched the records and just 10 days before the murder, Someone broke into Susan Dahl's house. 25 pairs of Dahl's underwear were taken. The thief also ejaculated on a towel. Because of the sexual elements of the break-in, the police thought that the same person who stole the underwear 10 days earlier also killed Dahl. On the night of the first break-in, several people saw a young man with shoulder-length blonde hair on a BMX bike hanging out in front of her home. A sketch was created and released to the public. Tips came in, but it did not lead to any arrests. The police had no idea who would want to kill Susan Dahl. They interviewed men she had dated, business associates, and other people who knew Dahl. They were able to eliminate them all as suspects. Over the next three months, there were more break-ins in Fort Collins where the only items that were stolen were women's underwear. Luckily, no one else was killed. But no arrests were made either. It wasn't long before Susan Dahl's murder was considered cold. We're just going to take a short break to bring you word from our sponsor, IP Vanish VPN. Do you ever feel like online ads are a bit too targeted? 
Do you think it's possible that you're being followed while you're online? Our amazing sponsor, IPVanish VPN, is here to help you take back your privacy and stay anonymous on the internet. You may be wondering, what exactly is IPVanish? Well, it's a virtual private network, or VPN for short. A VPN is a great tool that lets you browse the internet safely. You can use a VPN on everything that you connect to the internet, like a computer, phone, tablet, and even things like fire sticks for streaming media. When you use a VPN, everything you read, search, or watch is hidden through data encryption. This is important because what you do on the internet is no one else's business but your own. IPVanish helps you remain anonymous and secure on the internet. IPVanish has an incredible offer for Chrome listed viewers. They are offering 65% off for the first month, so it's just $3.49, or you get a whole year for just $31.49. Here's everything you get with IP Vanish. Anonymous IP addresses. This means that your personal IP address can't be tracked by anyone on the web. Circumvent any online censorship. IP Vanish has more than 1,500 servers in 70 plus locations. Get protection while using public Wi Fi. Remember, with IP Vanish, all your data is encrypted, so no one can snoop on what you're doing. They have great 24 7 support. Email, chat with them, even call them. They're there to help. So go to ipvanish.com slash listed to claim your 65% savings. They have plans starting at just $3.49 a month, or get an annual subscription for just $31.49. This is the time to sign up. With our discount and their current promotional offerings, you can get a VPN for 65% off their usual offering. IPVanish is the best of the best, even rated 4.7 out of 5 on Trustpilot, and that's with more than 6,000 reviews. Remember, it's IPVanish.com slash listed to get the deal and start protecting yourself online. Then, in July 1995, six years after the murder, the lead investigator was called to a house less than a mile from Susan Dahl's home. A repairman was inspecting the furnace and he found something odd. It was a ball of women's underwear. It turned out to be 13 pairs of underwear. The underwear was examined and semen was found on some of the pairs. It was compared to the semen that was found at the scene of the murder and it was a match. The lead investigator then checked to see if there were any criminal records that were connected to the house where the underwear was found. It turned out that three young men who had listed the house as their residence had been arrested for shoplifting. They were a pair of brothers, Keith and Douglas Thames and Paul Trujillo. At the time of the murders, they would have been between the ages of 15 and 16. What caught the attention of the lead investigator on the case was that one hobby the boys had was riding BMX bikes. The detective tracked down the three young men who were now in their early 20s. They were living in Grand Junction, Colorado. The detective collected samples of their hair, pubic hair, and blood along with their fingerprints. On July 31, 1995, an expert confirmed that one of the young men's fingerprints matched the fingerprints found at the crime scene. They were the fingerprints of Douglas Thames. Douglas was 16 years old at the time of the murder. He was arrested at his roofing job on August 4th, 1995. He denied committing the murder. Not long after he denied killing Susan Dahl, the results of the DNA test came back. It was Douglas's semen found at the crime scene and on the underwear found in the furnace. Douglas was charged with the first degree murder of Susan Dahl. Douglas Thames went to trial in the spring of 1996, nearly seven years after the murder. The prosecution felt like they had a strong case. Douglas's semen and fingerprints were all over the crime scene. But Douglas had an interesting alibi. He claimed he was out of town in Wyoming on a family vacation at the time of the murder. He even had proof his grandmother had photographs of the vacation. 
his grandmother's photo albums were submitted into evidence. The prosecution looked at the photographs and saw dates written on the back of some of the photos. The dates seemed to indicate that Douglas truly was out of the state where the murder was committed. The photo albums were a problem for the prosecution because if there was any reasonable doubt, the jury could acquit Douglas. As the prosecutors were examining the photos, they noticed something odd. Full dates for the day, month, and year were only written on the photographs that exonerated Douglas. Also, the other photos appeared to be out of order. For example, they had photos from Thanksgiving 1989. A relative was clean cut in one of the photos, but a few photos later, supposedly at the same event, the same relative has a thick mustache. On May 6, 1996, Douglas Thames was found guilty of first degree murder. He was given a life sentence with the chance of parole. Douglas is currently serving his sentence at the Buena Vista Correctional Complex in Buena Vista, Colorado. We're just going to take another short break to bring you a word from our sponsor, HelloFresh. HelloFresh is the number one meal kit in America, and having eaten several other meals, I completely understand why. Just the other day, I had some pork sammies from them, and they were delicious. I would have never thought of making something like that for myself. I'm craving one as I'm talking about it now. They always have a bunch of recipes to choose from that are designed and tested by professional chefs. Plus, they also have nutritional experts to ensure deliciousness and simplicity. Next week, I'm really looking forward to having cheesy stuffed burgers with garlic Cajun oven baked wedges. Not only does HelloFresh make meal planning easy, but I don't even have to go to the grocery store. HelloFresh's high quality fresh ingredients are sourced directly from growers and delivered from the farm to your front door in under a week, contact-free of course. You should check out HelloFresh because I bet you'll find a few meals that you'll want to make for yourself. And of course, they have an amazing deal for criminally listed viewers. Go to HelloFresh.com slash listed 14 and use the code listed 14 for up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. Once again, to get America's number one meal kit, go to HelloFresh.com slash criminally listed 14 and use the code criminally listed 14 to get up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. Also, a previous sponsor of this podcast, Green Chef, is now owned by HelloFresh. So there's a wider array of meals to choose from, so there's always something for everyone. I love switching between the brands, and now my listeners can enjoy both brands at a discount with me. The second tragic case we're going to talk about happened in June 1994, five years after Susan Dahl's murder. Like Dahl's murder, this one happened in Colorado. But this murder was committed in Palisade, which is about 340 miles from Fort Collins. June 4th, 1994 was a Saturday. If you turned on a pop radio station or MTV, you'd probably hear the sign by Ace of Base, I Swear by All For One, and The Power of Love by Celine Dion. That weekend, the live-action movie The Flintstones was enjoying its second weekend at the top of the box office. 19-year-old J.C. Taylor lived with a roommate, Brandy Bledsoe, in an apartment. That weekend, Bledsoe was out of town. Around 8.30 on the morning of June 4th, Taylor's downstairs neighbor saw water coming into his apartment through the ceiling. He went up to the apartment and he was able to get inside. In the bathtub, he found the dead body of 19-year-old J.C. Taylor. He called the police. Taylor was nude from the waist down. She had been beaten and then strangled to death with a dog leash which was still wrapped around her neck. It was also determined that she had been raped. The police found blood in the bathroom sink and other places throughout the living room. The police interviewed Taylor's roommate, Randy Bledsoe. She told them that their friend, Cynthia Mallow, had recently provided her and Taylor with methamphetamine. Mallow got the meth from her friend, 33-year-old Robert Dewey. A few days before the murder, 
Dewey, came over to the apartment where Taylor and Bledsoe lived. Bledsoe said that Dewey looked nervous and he appeared to be casing the apartment. The police tracked down Dewey and twice he lied about his identity. So the police were immediately suspicious of him. During the initial interview with Dewey, the police noted that there was a large gray sock on his right forearm. He initially said that he was helping his friend with his car and the battery exploded, injuring his arm. He later said that he was wearing the sock to cover the scars that he got from abusing meth. Dewey admitted that he was inside J.C. Taylor's apartment on June 3rd, the day before her body was found. He said he had shaved off his beard in the apartment. After Dewey was interviewed by the police, he and his wife fled town. One of Dewey's friends talked to the police. He told the police that Dewey gave him the handgun and asked him to hold on to it. It turned out that the handgun had been stolen. On June 22, 1994, Dewey was arrested in Pueblo, Colorado for the stolen gun. Dewey told the police that he had lied about his identity, shaved his beard, and left town because he was worried about getting in trouble for the stolen gun. After Dewey was arrested, another one of his friends went to the police. She said that Dewey had told her that he was at Taylor's apartment with at least four other people. They were partying and doing meth. The woman said that Dewey admitted to being at the apartment when Taylor was killed, but he said he didn't kill her. But then, months later, the woman changed her story. She claimed she was drunk when she talked to the police and said that Dewey never told her any of that stuff. In November 1994, Robert Dewey agreed to a plea deal regarding the stolen gun. Because of the plea deal, he was sentenced to a year in prison. The police were still suspicious of Dewey and they continued to build a case against him. They found a shirt that Dewey owned that had blood on it. It was examined and experts said that the blood was a mix of Dewey's blood and J.C. Taylor's blood. In April 1995, less than a year after the murder, Robert Dewey was charged with Taylor's murder. Robert Dewey's trial started in September 1996. Dewey said that he was at home when the murder was committed. At the time of the murder, Dewey and his wife were living with a friend and that friend testified. They said that Dewey was not at home on the night of the murder. Another witness testified and he said that he gave Dewey a ride on the morning of Saturday, June 4th, when Taylor's body was found. The man said that Dewey pointed out the apartment building and said that a woman in the building had been strangled with a dog chain. This was way too early for someone who wasn't involved in the crime to know specific details. Dewey argued that he got a ride from his friend on Sunday morning, which was the day after the body was found. Then came the DNA evidence. An expert for the prosecution testified about the blood on the shirt. She said that the blood could have come from Dewey and Taylor. But she also testified that 45% of Caucasian people could have contributed to the DNA. The defense had their own DNA expert testify. Both DNA experts agreed that the DNA found under Taylor's fingerprints did not belong to Dewey, nor did any of the blood found in Taylor's apartment. The prosecution had an explanation for this. They said that Dewey had an unidentified partner who helped him commit the murder. The trial lasted for a month and the jury deliberated for a day. Robert Dewey was found guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. Robert Dewey's lawyer started filing appeals, but he ended up losing all of them. Eleven years after he was convicted, in 2007, they contacted the Innocence Project. They agreed to help Dewey, and they had the blood on the shirt tested again. 
it turned out that there was only one set of DNA on the shirt, and that was Dewey's DNA. Years later, the Colorado Attorney General's Office received a $1.2 million federal grant to fund the DNA Justice Review Project. In 2011, the DNA Justice Review tested the DNA found under Taylor's fingernails and around the apartment. Then the DNA was submitted to CODIS. A match to the DNA was found. The DNA belonged to a man who was in prison because he had been convicted in May 1996 for a similar rape and murder that happened in August 1989 in Fort Collins. That man's name was Douglas Thames, and he was in prison for the murder of Susan Dahl. It turned out that, at the time of J.C. Taylor's murder, Douglas lived on the same street. According to investigators, he lived just two or three buildings away. One investigator said you get thrown a baseball from his building to Taylor's building. J.C. Taylor was killed about a year before Douglas was arrested for Susan Dahl's murder. Robert Dewey was arrested for Taylor's murder about four months before Douglas was arrested for killing Dahl. Douglas Thames had never been a suspect or a person of interest in J.C. Taylor's murder. J.C. Taylor was friends with Douglas's girlfriend and they socialized together. After Douglas's DNA was linked to the crime scene, he was interviewed. He said he didn't know why his DNA was at the crime scene. He also denied knowing Taylor. However, several eyewitnesses had already told the police that they knew each other. Douglas admitted that he owned a dog at the time of the murder, but claimed he never took it for walks and that he didn't even own a leash. Of course, no one believed him. On April 30th, 2012, Robert Dewey's conviction was vacated and he was released from prison. He had spent 16 years in prison for a murder that he didn't commit. That same day, Douglas Thames was charged with J.C. Taylor's murder. In September 2013, Robert Dewey was awarded $1.2 million in compensation for the 16 years he wrongly spent in prison. Douglas Thames went to trial for Taylor's murder in November 2015, 21 years after the murder. He was found guilty. He was sentenced to life without the chance of parole. Barring some type of change in the law or a sentence being commuted, Douglas Thames will most likely die in prison. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. As always, our producer, sound designer, and fact checker was now Clute If you just discovered this podcast, please check out our YouTube channel, Criminally Listed. We have over 300 videos, and most videos feature three strange but true crime stories. You can find it at youtube.com slash criminally listed. If you enjoyed Into the Killing, please subscribe or follow so you don't miss any future episodes. Well, that's all for this week. Thanks again for listening. Please take care of yourself and stay safe.